Yes, we get a new bill assigned. We are not taking any bills by and having a special meeting for bills taken by. We'll, we'll do whatever we have to do if we get any new bills. Um, but that's just a heads up. Um, we have some folks who need to get back to some places, so we're going to hear Delegate O'Bannon um, right now, and then we'll hear uh, Chairman Marshall's bill right after that. Um, I think Delegate O'Bannon's bill is fairly straightforward, but come on up and. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, 1748, uh, Health Law Section of the Bar Association. Uh, it it uh, clarifies who can uh, work uh, in the free clinic system. Uh, uh, this is indemnification, I think, which is the. I think it's an immunity thing. It is an immunity thing, and uh, Mr. Moore here can speak to it, but it's uh, those folks who work around the clinic setting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, subcommittee, Jeff Palmore uh, with Reed Smith on behalf of the Virginia Bar Association. Uh, the, the code section that this is amending already provides liability protection for healthcare providers that are working at uh, free health clinics around the Commonwealth. Uh, this would uh, add to that uh, those um, persons and individual and groups that organize, arrange, promote, or administer such services. That could be the, um, the church that hosts a uh, a free clinic in their fellowship hall, uh, the Boy Scout troop that helps do publicity for one of these free clinics, uh, and making sure that uh, they have the same protections. Uh, if there is gross negligence or willful misconduct that takes place, they would still be uh, liable for that. Uh, so I think the charitable immunity doctrine would already cover those folks. The issue as I read it is that you have people who um, who administer the service, the administrative level folks, and other people who may be compensated for what they're doing. It's not charitable, but not a charitable role. This is picking those folks up and giving them the same protection the providers themselves have. Like, like the administrator. Yeah, do you care? Okay, all right. Anybody here speak in favor of the bill? Uh, we have a list of supporters, Mount Society, Nurses, Dental Association, Anesthesiologists, Health Wagon, and Therapists. Awesome. Um, anybody here speak in opposition to the bill? All right, any questions for the patron or for the BBA? All right, we have a motion to report uh, House Bill 1748, moved and seconded, any debate, hearing none, all those in favor say aye, aye, those opposed, thank you, sir. All right, Chairman Marshall, this is your damn bill, filing bill. Yes, sir, and I'd like to make it an amendment, if I may. All right, let's pull this up, House Bill 1699, I think, the, I think your housing commission's taking a look at it, too. Yeah, yeah, we put it all last year on it. So what I'd like to add, at the uh, end of line 13, uh, it says uh, ordinance adopted by the city council. I'd like to add after a public hearing. All right. So um, if you have the bill in front of you, that says such pilot projects may only be established by ordinance adopted by the city council. Insert after public hearing. Yes, sir. Public hearing. If that's a correct place, but got that for it. Um, so I'm not on city's counties and towns. I don't know what all the rules are for public hearings and everything. Does anybody who stay in your local government? All right, would you like to make that motion as an amendment? All right, move and second that we amend uh, the bill to add that clause at the end of line 13. Any debate here? None. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed? All right, so the amended bill is not before us. Go ahead, sir. So, uh, House Bill 1699 authorizes a pilot project at the City of Dallas, supported by the Virginia House Commission. The Virginia House Commission spent uh, all last year looking at this uh, idea. This is a very little case. It would provide the city an additional tool to collect delinquent taxes while at the same time not interfering with the overwhelming majority of deeds or recordation. Uh, the bill will allow the Danville City Council by ordinance uh, after a public hearing to provide that no deed uh, to ban a parcel of real estate that has an assessed value of $50,000 or less. This pilot pro uh, program would not apply to certain other conveyances, instruments such as a deed of trust, deeds of diseases, and deeds of conveyor property. The problem we have in the City of Danville Approximately 12% of the housing in Danville is vacant. And so uh, these houses are being passed down, passed down, and we're getting so many uh, you know, tax liens against these things that uh, once they are sold, uh, the tax is not getting paid for it. So what this deal will do is uh, hopefully get uh, some of the back taxes paid. And the, um, the city director of finance in Danville, who's going to be having to do a bunch more work, they're all good with this, right? Uh, yes, they, they were the one that actually brought the idea. This bill came uh, from the uh, from the city of Dale. I have some people here who would like to speak. Uh, right, yeah. If you have 
you're here to testify the bill, come on up, introduce yourself, and offer your testimony. Association. Uh, we are sensitive to the, the situation in Danville and you know, appreciate what the commissioner is trying to do. I think we just want to, um, you know, we, we have some concerns with the precedent that this sets about um, putting impediments on the transfer of, of property. Um, if this were a statewide approach uh, or you know, did have thresholds in there, uh, then we, we might object to it. But you know, I think under those circumstances, we just want to raise the issue of the precedent that this sets that. And um, does, the, does the Housing Commission report to the General Assembly? Uh, it would be interesting for those of us who have this bill at this level to get to see the data that the Housing Commission gets, and I know you could help us with that. Well, we can if you want to add an amendment to, uh, to you know, include Greg V to uh, just right. say, you know, we could do we that. We may also. just make that standard on all legislation. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out how this would actually work and what we're trying to get at. I, so I assume what I'm hearing is we got lots of property that, that's vacant and people die, uh, they don't pay the taxes, and the city would have a lien against those properties. But what is this going to help with? Um, the, lien, the, the tax lien is still there. I think what they're trying to get at is a guy who owes the taxes so he gives the property to his brother or to somebody else and that transfer. So yeah, the lien still attaches to the property. That's why I asked that question earlier. Well, that's still going to be a problem. Mr. Chairman, I would say that
So let's say somebody does this deed, the consideration is $40,000, they show up in the clerk's office and it doesn't have the seal from the, from the finance person. Right. It, it, it doesn't, you, you can't record it, even if, the, if there is, there are no taxes due? The chairman, I'd say that the bill is not common. That the purpose of the bill would be to require the certificate from the, uh, the director of finance and it was filed on top of the deed and the $40,000 deed was prescribed. So the deed would be returned to the submitter. The submitter would then have to go to the finance department and say either the taxes have been paid or work out something with the finance director. This was modeled after legislation that was adopted in North Carolina on a local option basis. Delegate Marshall had this bill last year as a local option for all localities and a lot of the stakeholders felt there might be some problems with that, but everybody was comfortable with giving it a try in the city of Danville on a limited basis for three years. And let's see how it works. So that was, that's the, that's the basis of how, where we came from and how we got to where we are. Mr. Chairman, this is a great, great bill for Danville and other places that might have blighted property because we'll make sure that the, somehow those taxes get paid before any transfers occur. So Mr. Chairman, I'd say that the delegate from Toscana, the concern that a number of stakeholders had was that if you start having the clerk reject a number of different deeds, that particularly with mortgages would be applicable to that property, then it could cause the, the loans to expire and create a whole a host of other problems. So what we try to do is narrow it to properties less than 50 grand, adjust in the city of Danville to see how it works, and then to look at the product of our experience and, and then uh, have further consideration the House Commission. I don't know if this question would be for Chip or for the bar or for anybody up here who does real estate law, but what would, I mean, I think you normally go to closing, money is handed over maybe, probably before the deed is recorded, isn't it? But then it's, but it's held in the attorney's trust account, and so you would essentially unwind the transfer. The, the deal wouldn't close, you couldn't disperse the money because you couldn't record the deed. Mr. Chairman, I would, I would say that what would happen is in a transaction with the settlement agent and the buyer who's buying the property doesn't want to buy the property subject to the real estate lien. So what would happen is the settlement agent would collect the money, pay the uh, real estate lien as part of the, the settlement on the property. So that's the way it would work in the vast majority of transactions. And again, this bill doesn't change that. It just changes the situation of what the city can do and what the clerk should do in a circumstance where there's distressed property, if you will, and somebody's trying to avoid paying their real estate taxes and not going, not using the settlement agent. Because any time you use the settlement agent, the taxes would be collected and paid. Come on up, sir. How are you? Uh, it's good yeah, to see you. Maybe a quick comment. I uh, appreciate uh, the fine job that Delegate Marshall and uh, Chip Dix have done. Let me just add a couple of things on behalf of the city of Danville. Um, last year, Delegate Marshall's bill was a local option statewide. Did, it, did not matter about the amount of money involved in the uh, transaction. So this is really, really narrowed down. Having been a former practitioner in them, it's been my experience that typically for these kind of transactions, you don't have a lawyer involved in the closing. You wish you did. You, you, you get the taxes paid then because the seller doesn't want to take the property with a lien on it. But typically it's when uh, a person comes into the law office and here's, the, here's my daddy's deed. Uh, will you draw it up and put it in my name? That's all the lawyer does. Lawyer charges him for the deed, and then the client signs it while he gets it notarized in the, in the law office and takes it to the clerk's office. That's all this is designed to do is, is to help catch those people. Governor Kilgore had a boyhood friend who was my law partner who was head of our real estate section. And these deeds just drove me crazy. We didn't even want to see them. But um, that's what it's designed to get at. And um, to the, the Virginia Bar's point, it's just a pilot project. If it's cumbersome, it won't be statewide. If it, it doesn't work in Danville, it probably wouldn't work in Charlottesville. In Danville, the director of finance office happens to be right down the hall from the clerk, which made it very convenient. I didn't have to go to another building to the third floor and, you know, fourth door and the rest. So uh, we think it's a, a very modest effort to see 
if that city with all of its um, financial issues can improve this situation. So thank you. And Mr. Chairman, do you want to add language to uh, to get the report uh, to uh, courts, or do you just want us to still be chairing the common commission? Uh, I call you. Yes, they hadn't done a coup yet, so <laughs> nobody else wants it. It's like code commission. We let John Edwards be in charge. Um, Second to recommend reporting um, the bill as amended um, in the discussion. All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right, thanks, sir. Thank you for your time. Um, for the patrons sitting out here, we're probably going to be a while. So if you've got other places to go, just come and go and check in. And we'll get, I've got a list here. We'll call people in this order. But if you're not here, we'll just get to you when we get back in the room. So, like Simon, going to be a while. Um, Lindsay's going to be a while. Everybody's is till we get a hold of it. And then it's not. Um, all right, Delegate Yost, is he in here? Nope. Del Delegate Will. Come on up. Thanks for 
seeing these bills, what you see in here, which is a reference not just to the court, uh, the county or the city in which the person resides, but also the circuit court of the city of Richmond. What? Why is that there? It's got to be some history behind why that's written that way. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd say to Del Toscano, my understanding of the reason the city of Richmond is mentioned is because the state registrar is, is based in the city of Richmond, the state agency, and so therefore it would be appropriate if there was some dispute or something. Let's vote on the substitute, and then I know I've got a bunch of questions that we talked about earlier today, and we'll go from there. So, all right, we have a motion and a second to adopt substitute. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right. Um, let's hear from folks in favor of the bill. Um, Mr. Chairman, my name is Larry Spiaggi, and I'm the funeral director here in Chesterfield County. I also represent the Virginia Funeral Directors Association. Um, the uh, purpose behind this is uh, currently the process can take eight months or longer to go through it. There was no real rhyme or reason of how it happened and, and all that. We just felt like this spelled it out. It did, as Jim said, it gave, gives us a roadmap of what to follow, uh, the forms that will be uh, applied to it and uh, through that all along. Um, I know there were some concerns and stuff in We'll answer them if, if you uh, have them. Okay? Thank you, sir. All right, anybody else here speak in favor of the bill? I do think the substitute addressed some of the concerns. I've let the speakers know some other concerns I had. Um, all right, anybody here speak in opposition to the bill? Right, let me enunciate my concerns, and then y'all can answer them. Right, so I, these are either concerns or issues for folks to be aware of. Issue number one the where he resides is actually for the Petitioner, not for the decedent. And so who someone who is petitioning can file in any circuit court where they reside, as I read this, um, because if any person may file a circuit court in which he resides, there's no limit on who could file. So in theory, someone totally unrelated to the decedent with no interest could go file in a remote jurisdiction. And the only service of process requirements on the state registrar, it's not on interested parties, it's not on family members, it's not on next of kin spouse, any of that kind of stuff. So um, those were the concerns I have as the bill is drafted. I do think taking the judicial decision away from the clerk and putting it in the court is the right way to do it, as long as the Supreme Court is comfortable that can be done by form. And I'm assuming they are, because they didn't stand up. Um, so Mr. Dix et al., those are my concerns, the who can file, where they can file, and who needs to get notice of it. Um, and just want to make sure this doesn't set up a potential for abuse <laughs> after the fact. I also think not allowing amendment of the cause of death this way actually takes away a lot of the other concerns too. So, all right, those are my concerns. Mr. Chairman, I would say that I don't think from a clerk's perspective that we have any problem with, with editing the uh, substitute to do that. I don't think the funeral directors do either. What happens, and I make the observation, we all know this as lawyers, what happens is when you start getting specific on certain concerns that are
anybody else on the subcommittee have any questions uh, while they're here? I mean, the committee doesn't have to take the bill by Wednesday. You can vote it up or down now or right, send it out of here. I, I, those concerns would cause me to vote no for now is all I'm trying to enunciate. So, what are your concerns? Yeah, so the concerns that I have, and, and, and it's, it's not necessarily that they're bill killers, it's that we need to be aware of and think through. First one is that there's no limitation on who can file this petition. So anybody, there's no need to have any kind of connection to the decedent. Uh, there is um, no limitation. The only limitation on where they file is that it's filed where the petitioner lives. I understand that for convenience purposes because the petitioner may be far away from where the person died. The problem with that is when you don't have a limit on who can file it, then random person in Bristol can file a petition in Bristol for family and dead person in Fairfax. And then the third one is there's no notice or service on anybody other than the state registrar. Now, it might be that because there's nobody else listed in the death certificate, there's no way to give anybody else notice or identify who they should get notice of. I don't know what information the state registrar has. If they have a next of kin registry or something like that, I don't think they do. So it may be an unsolvable problem, but I could see a problem where some widows husband's death certificate gets amended in a problematic way and they never even knew it happened. You know, the middle name gets changed or maiden name gets changed or something like that. Child from previous marriage or something. Is that Child from previous marriage wants to change the name on the record because that matters for some reason and nobody else knows it happened. Chairman? I agree. I have same, similar concerns how that could impact also uh, the uh, insurance proceeds. You know, how the insurance companies are, are not look for offenses or differences, and if it has a name change or something like that, then the insurance beneficiaries may not be able to collect. Well, and, and, I, and I think that's actually why you want the bill, because an error in the death certificate may prevent, and they need to come in and fix it, but the flip side is also the case that, you know, you could have two, you could have two, you could have two life insurance policies that because someone changed their name, the name on the life insurance policy looks different, and so you could end up with this becoming an issue. Well, then, Chairman, uh, I think if, if you would be so kind as to go by for the day, we'll come back on Wednesday and tell you what Will just mentioned uh, to me that all of these things that the Chairman's raised and Delegate the Delegates raised, these things can happen today. And so the problem with being specific and giving a roadmap is that you don't cover everything that is potentially an issue. And so we'll address these. some of the folks today, but you and I haven't gotten a chance to talk. Um, we actually have another bill that has to go by for the day at the patron's request, which is um, Weber's, what's the number on Weber's bill, 1989. So let's have a motion on 1989 and 2276 to take them by for the day. All right, moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, all right. We have adopted the substitute to Delegate Will's bill, so that's the bill that we'll be working from. Wednesday's our last meeting. It's gonna be over in the Capitol. On Wednesday. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chairman. Sir, All right, Chairman Langenfelter, you're up.
statute that was better defined to BCJS what they should be requiring. And the language, Mr. Chairman, they recommended to me this summer was, um, in fact, comprehensive general liability insurance. Since then, uh, Bob Ranchons and other uh, and other insurance experts have come to me and said, no, that's probably not the best way to express it. I have put them together with the SCOPs, and now I have an amendment. I apologize for not submitting this earlier, but I have an amendment that can properly frame what kind of insurance we're talking about for SCOPs. Right? Mr. Shannon, on line 111 on page 2 of the Angus Bill, strike comprehensive general, insert personal injury, after the word liability, After the word liability, after personal injury? Mm -hmm. So between liability and insurance? Um, no, after personal injury, yes. Personal injury, liability, liability, and then that section, and then insurance? Correct. Okay. And after insurance, insert to include professional liability insurance. And what was the code section you cited? 38.2-117. And what is that?
code section. So that, here's, that'd here's, probably be the best thing to do. Here's the, yeah, here's the problem we have. This used to be a bond. And during our big study a couple of years ago on SBOPs, the idea was, well, why don't we replace bond with insurance? And so they did. And now it's very much complicated, the issue, because they're not, they're not like, you know, the police department. They have policing powers. They may not have the ability to get the same policy as the Henrico Police Department does. And they're in private business. I mean, they guard banks, they guard malls, they guard the airports. There are lots of things they do that's a public service. And essentially, by raising the bar and creating this very narrow insurance product available to them, you can drive some of them out, but they're not going to be able to get coverage. So what we're in seek, seek, search of, Mr. Chairman and subcommittee, is an appropriate insurance posture for them so that they can continue to do their work. Now, if I may, and I don't want to complicate your day, but if you'll recall the day I asked the bill to go by on the floor, and I haven't completely read it into the debate yet, but it, it is similar in respect that it deals with security businesses and their insurance products, and I caught that today. And so that this one came through general laws. Hey, buddy, this is your bill. It came through general laws. My bill is coming through you. We need to get both of these bills in the same body and get them aligned properly, Mr. Chairman, which is why I have not spoken to Clayton about this. We may want to re-refer that bill back to this subcommittee. I know, guys, I got it. I know you don't want to look at more work. I got it. But if we're going to fix this problem, we need to fix it one time. What is it? What kind of insurance policy is this bill like? His bill basically says liability insurance. That's all it says. Delegate from research. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Perhaps uh, uh, some of you guys who get insurance bills and comments might be able to answer this, but is the, is the term comprehensive general, is that a defined term in the code, or is it no. one of these generic terms we don't really see it? That's how we can substitute. We struck that comprehensive general. Oh, we it. thought that was appropriate. But then they, they're, they're striking that. The substitute we adopted, the amendment we adopted, struck that, put in personal injury liability, reference 38.2117. Okay. 38.2117 is the generic code section that just says a personal injury liability insurance policy is a insurance policy that insures you against personal injury, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so then there'd be a bunch of, there's a, there are multiple types of policies that would be personal injury liability. This is a broad, section. The issue is going to be, the same issue is, are they going to be able to obtain insurance that actually covers them for this type of behavior? And Mr. Chairman, the, the SCOPs I've spoken to uh, tell me, yes, that this would satisfy the, the language I've given you would work. Now, I know you want to vet it. I'm fine with that. We don't need to do it today. But, but we really got to get this right because otherwise we're going to have the consequence putting people out of business right. if we're not careful. What, what we need to do is get the property casualty insurance folks, D DCJS, and maybe someone from the Bureau of Insurance, um, to make sure that there are policies that comply. I'll give you an example. I had a brilliant idea a few years ago to require aviation insurance policies with a certain minimum in for general aviation. It turns out you can't actually, nobody can actually buy it because it's too expensive and the market doesn't really exist. So, that's right. what we're looking for, Mr. Chair. We're looking for the sweet spot between yeah. what we ought to have, okay, and what is realistic to have. There's that intersection. And right now, I don't think we're there. Oddly enough, we were probably there with the bond, but we're not, we've done away with that, so now we need insurance there. So, yeah, I think, the, I think that did screw it up. And, and there is a self-insurance provision in here. That, that, is, that would be correct. And, and, and I would suggest the same language for Mr. Fowler's bill when it comes to a point where we can get them together. Put the knife away, buddy. Um, all right, Rick, did we, we didn't adopt that amendment, I don't think. Um, I, think the, I think the right way to say it, the amendment that the, that the, the Chairman Lindefeld is requesting is by evidence of a personal injury liability insurance policy as that term is defined in 
38.2-117 for self-insurance. So I think that would be the proper amendment. Does that seem right for it? All right, we have a motion on that amendment. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, we amend the bill. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right. Um, I think, I mean, I guess what my suggestion would be if we're inclined to push, take this bill forward, to go ahead and do it with the understanding that BCDAS, Bureau of Insurance, Property Casualty folks, are the Property Casualty folks not in the room? Mr. Chairman, when, when is the committee going to meet? Only meets one more time, and it's Wednesday, and I would try not to get you jacked Here's up. Here's what I would that. do. I will get BCJS and the Bureau in my office, okay. and I will do that tomorrow, and I will try to see if we can't get some kumbaya. So you want us to take a buy and then here, buy out? No, no, I, if you're fine with taking it to the full, we can show up with the full, and then dispense with it by saying either we have agreement or we don't have agreement, and then the full committee can vote as they will. Everybody good with that? Um, I would also, I'd suggest you try to find Lego or one of the other property casualty oh, guys. I'll, I'll get, them. get them in the room. All right, uh, amended bill before the committee. Any questions for the patron? Anybody else here to speak in opposition to the bill? Are you ambivalent? You don't care, right? The, the policy uh, administration does not have I mean, I think the, I think the, I think Chairman Lindenfeld would like us to advance this bill to the full with the understanding that he may have some additional testimony at full. Um, if that's what we do, Andy, we'll put it on the contested docket just so we don't, doesn't get moving too fast. All right, bill before the committee. All right, motion to report uh, House Bill 1524 as amended, moved and seconded in debate. Hearing none, those in favor say aye. Aye, aye. those opposed? All right, we'll keep it on the regular. Mr. Chairman, just as a footnote, I'm gonna, Or you can do a set aside. Or we just kill it. <laughs> you ever seen anything like that before? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, all right, Rush. Elliot Rush. So, yeah. Second. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. This deals with epinephrine. Um, private and public higher institutes of higher uh, learning. It's the same thing we did for our public and private uh, K through 12 schools, exempt from civil liability, folks who had done the training and administered this uh, drug uh, in emergency situations. And the, I think this is on line 119, this is a new, so we have, this is a long immunity section, so this adds a 14 and is a public institution of higher education, private institution of higher education, is supposed to mirror what we did before for K-12, right? Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Chairman, it mirrors uh, section 13 of that. So it's the same language, it just adds uh, institutions of higher learning. Thank you. 
Commission of the Bill. Or call on Mr. Chairman, I'm Charlie Brosen. I represent the treasurer. And uh, the delegate has explained it very well. All right, fantastic. Um, so the issues that have come up in the other bill are the question of consent and the question of notice of fees and stuff like that. And so there may be some people at some point as that bill goes forward or dies, if they need to be aligned. Um, right now, you're picking up the right language that was existing about having one opportunity to draw with no fee. Um, but there's not a requirement in here that they get notice of any fees that might happen after that first free withdrawal. And so that may be something that folks at some point want to consider adding to go this forward. Delegate Mitchell. Chairman, I think uh, it's important to the practice Concept. What I don't want is some juror to get 99 cents of the dollar because there's a fee being taken out of the debit card. I'd rather them just get you know, legal tender if there's going to be some kind of a transfer fee or convenience fee or whatever you call it for using um, the um, prepaid debit card as a part of your juror, you know, just compensation. So the other, that is another analogous situation with the tax. The bill that I'm talking about is a bill that Delegate Ward has that says, the current law says you have to pay your employees using cash, check, or electronic transfer. And she's um, adding in on these cards that you have to get consent from the employee and you have to provide them notice of any and all fees. I think she accidentally struck the one free withdrawal. Um, so, anyway, I, in theory, somebody could offer an amendment that said not only you had to have one free withdrawal, but that you had to provide notice of any fees that might go with the card. I don't think the patron's asking for that, and I think that's only would only be necessary if that was the obstacle to the bill going forward. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, Delegate Hudson, is I don't know if I agree with the premise that every prepaid card has to have a fee. Is that correct? No, it doesn't have to. The company that we know we're to to the point that Randy raises that that was the company that we made the deal with to, to send out people's payments. So I don't know that it necessarily means it has to have a fee attached. Unless I'm wrong. But no, I mean, the law doesn't require to have a fee attached, but this just says if you do have a fee, you have to have at least one free withdrawal without any fees, and then they start charging fees after the first time. And so one could, for example, say, hey, you ought to give them notice that after the first withdrawal, they have to start paying fees, so maybe they'll withdraw 100% the first time. Um, again, that notice of subsequent fees would be the only thing that someone else might care about, and I don't, because it's just me. Um, all right, I think I already asked. I know you spoke in favor. Anybody here in opposition to the bill? Do you care? Do you care? All right. Um, all right, the bill is for the committee. Any questions for the patron? All right, we have a motion to recommend reporting House Bill 23-24. We have a second. Move and second it. Any debate? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Second. We have one now. So I think it sounds like a contested topic for four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Bulova, Delegate Bulova's up. Delegate Bulova has. 2307, okay. I think. Okay. All right, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, um, House Bill 2307 deals with the cover sheet for land records. It's created by the Office of the Executive Secretary of the Supreme Court. Um, I think you all know that HOA uh, declarations under the Property Owners Associations Act uh, represents a binding contract to future property owners, deals with everything from architectural review to parking, uh, to uh, complaint resolution. Uh, most of these declarations are, are very well crafted, um, but in fact, under the Property Owners Association Act, um, there isn't a list of standards or standard items that have to be in, in a declaration. So every once in a while, uh, you do wind up with a badly constructed uh, declaration. And, uh, we've had testimony before the Housing Commission to that effect. And I guess what's really tough is because declarations typically have a very high threshold for amendments, once you get a bad declaration, it's very hard to be able to undo that. Uh, back in 2000,
2015, uh, the General Assembly uh, passed legislation that had the Common Interest Community Board put together some best practices for declarations. They pulled together stakeholders and came up with uh, what I think is a, a really good document that provides guidance on what should be in a declaration. So that the next question is, is how do we make sure that that is used or, or at least reviewed and, and referenced? And so that's what, what this bill does. Um, last year, I actually submitted a bill that went before uh, counties and cities and towns um, looking at how to do that in one way. Uh, frankly, the whole builders didn't like that at all. Uh, but they also came back to me and said perhaps this is a better approach uh, that they would be willing to support. And since all of these declarations have to be filed with the land records, uh, the concept in here is, is just making sure that you have some simple acknowledgement uh, that you've reviewed and considered the best practices that the Common Interest Community Board has put together uh, before you actually file and make official uh, the declarations uh, that are going to be bound upon an HOA. Um, so it provides continued flexibility, doesn't mandate everything, but just simply makes sure that there's a, a marker out there so that uh, these lawyers know that there's a resource available from the Common Interest Community Board. I'm going to call the subcommittee of higher education to order. Um, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to take, I think we're missing one patron anyway right now. We're going to take one uh, budget amendment, the speaker's budget amendment. We'll go ahead and do that. Uh, and then we're going to do the two bills, and then we'll take the rest of the budget amendment. So I think Chris White is going to address um, the budget amendment we have concerning Mary Washington. Page five of your back. Page five. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. My name is Chris White. I'm here on behalf of the University of Mary Washington. Uh, the university is seeking some initial resources for seed funding to create and enhance some high quality programs to meet the needs of the adult education population in the region, including veterans, first generation, and other non traditional learners. 
Uh, we envision credit and non-credit courses being delivered with flexibility suited to working adults, including evening and online courses. Uh, by investing and creating these high quality programs, the university will be able to fill a key role in regional economic development, building on the budget language uh, that you all approved uh, in partnership with the Fredericksburg Regional Alliance last session. Uh, UMW is uniquely positioned in the region, given the several military bases in our area to provide these programs for our veterans population. Uh, additionally, this investment will re-energize our Stafford campus, eventually being able to pay for itself, thus helping keep tuition low and assist with realigning some of our structural challenges for our overall budget that I know uh, many of you are aware of. I'd be happy to answer any questions if the subcommittee has any. Any questions for Mr. White? I note that's uh, seems to be high. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. All right, let's go to the bills. We're going to start with a delicate assignment, you have HB 1916, if everyone will focus in on that particular bill. Welcome, Delegate Thomas. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee. How are you this afternoon? We're good. How are you? Good. So, uh, House Bill 1916 establishes a Virginia Student Loan Authority. Uh, what we're trying to do here is um, give the Commonwealth uh, and our residents a tool uh, to deal with what's really become a, a very, uh, I call it a crisis uh, as far as student loan debt is concerned. Uh, we've got uh, over $300 million in outstanding student loan debt in Virginia, over $1.3 billion in outstanding student loan debt nationwide, and there are a number of strategies uh, that have been employed to begin to deal with that. Uh, and I know that uh, members of this committee uh, and the House have, have, are we're looking hard at ways to make college more affordable going forward. Uh, looking at ways to increase uh, grant funding and give incentives uh, for students to finish those things in four years and, and minimize the cost and the amount of debt they have to take on. This bill, though, is mostly focused on people that have already graduated uh, from universities, have already got a degree, uh, and now are trying to become fully uh, full participants in the Virginia economy, uh, but are hampered by the amount of student loan debt that they're saddled with. So, uh, you know, where we, we tell kids, you know, growing up and coming out, so listen, you know, study hard, get good grades, get yourself into a good college or university, uh, work hard for those four years, and get your degree, and that's going to be your ticket out of poverty and into the middle class, or out of the middle class and into the upper middle class. It's your, it's your, your success, it's your ticket to success. Uh, unfortunately, if you come out with too much debt, um, it doesn't necessarily work out that way for you. And you've got this large unmanageable student loan payment that you've got to deal with, um, with terms that may not have been fully explained to you uh, at the outset when you were 18 years old in the bursar's office trying to figure out, how you know, this is great, I'm so excited I got into this university, but now how do I pay for it? So he says, don't worry about it. We'll make sure it gets paid for it. We'll get you in. Uh, let's just take the, uh, you, you, you tell us what you want to take, what classes you need to take, we'll find the money for you. You'll worry about that when you get out. Unfortunately, the economy where a lot of folks got out in the early 2000s was not what they thought it would be. Um, and those uh, student loan debts uh, had provisions where you could do a forbearance, for instance. You take the time, some time off making your payments, uh, which we have understood if you did that, and we heard from uh, uh, Virginia and George Mason University about a year and a half ago. Uh, she took a forbearance for a couple of years, and all that interest that she wasn't paying was getting lumped back in to the principal of that loan. And the loan grew from what was a modest amount so an, un an unsustainable amount. So how we deal with that with this particular bill is we give uh, student loan borrowers the ability uh, to do what most of us can do with our mortgage loan, which is take advantage of today's really historically low interest rates, right? And I think a number of us on the committee, and, and I know I have at least four or five times, refinance my, my, my mortgage, home mortgage as rates went down, saving me two, three, four hundred dollars a month in some cases that we could keep going down with interest rates. Unfortunately, a lot of folks with federal student loans can't do that. Um, you can't go to the current servicer and pay off your loan at a, at a better rate. So what this bill proposes to do is to create an authority here in Virginia where we can sell bonds using the, the, the lending power of uh, the Commonwealth, all these municipal bonds which are tax advantaged at really favorable interest rates, and then loan that money back out uh, to Virginia students who've got student loan debt at high interest rates, allow them to take advantage of those low rates consolidate some of the maybe a number of different student loans into one manageable payment uh, and get them fully participating in Virginia's economy. Now, last year I came and proposed an authority to just do that. 
Um, and uh, Chairman Kilgore done at Congress and Labor said, you know, let's take a look at that. I and mean, it sounds like a really big idea to try and handle. Let's send it off to Shem, 529 and Treasury, and look at the wisdom of that. And they came back and said, there's a couple of problems with that approach, Larry Simon. Just talking about myself as a person, I shouldn't do that. But anyway, they said, there's a couple of problems with that. Uh, they said, you know, the risk pool is pretty small, it's pretty narrow. It's just people that really need to refinance their existing student loan. Um, you're going to expose the Commonwealth to maybe more risk than you want to. We can't offset that with another a different, you know, with more A borrowers, as we call them in the mortgage industry, really good borrowers. They said, if you want to do this, either go small or go big. So I'm sorry, being the ambitious guy that I am, went big. Uh, it said, well, you know, let's bring back the Virginia Student Loan Authority altogether, um, and let's allow this Student Loan Authority to do what it did from 1975 to 1997, and make loans to all kinds of Virginians, uh, to folks entering medical school, law school, entering four-year universities, uh, and let's give them the authority to refinance existing student loans. And that's the model that works really well in Rhode Island, for instance. That's sort of the classic, they're one of the first uh, states to try and do this. So their existing Rhode Island Student Loan Authority got into the business of refinancing existing student loans in addition to what they were already doing. Uh, and they found they've been very successful. They can take loans of you know, 9.5%, 10%, refinance them to 4.5%, people's payments way down. Um, and it's actually turned out to be a benefit to the Treasury. Uh, they actually make money on the student loan refinance work that they do there. So it's not the first, we're not the first folks to try this. It's been done elsewhere. Uh, and what this bill would do would, again, be establish that authority um, and, and get us back in the business of doing uh, student loans for folks that need it. Okay. Any questions for the patrons? Tell your mask. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I've got a series of questions for Delegate Simon. I'm happy to uh, go through you, but it might make more sense. I think it makes more sense to answer correctly. Sorry, um, Delegate Simon, I mean, we up here on this side of the aisle um, are big believers in access and affordability in our higher education. I got to tell you, as a you know, as a capital markets professional and as a finance professional and as somebody who has made and collected billions of dollars of loans, I'm a little concerned about putting the state of Virginia or this loan authority uh, in the bank in the student loan banking business. So I just would like to ask you. I mean, I mean, you personally, do you have any uh, banking or capital markets education training or experience? I have no, I wouldn't call it capital markets experience, no. My, my experience has been very much the retail end of things, uh, helping folks refinance their existing mortgages and things like that. So you are in the um, mortgage business and you help people refinance their mortgages, is that correct? Well, I'm a real estate title attorney, and so I work with mortgage lenders on the retail side and help close loans and do, uh, you know, notes deed of trust. But when it comes to the, when those loans get you know, bundled together and financed and sold off, that's, that, that's beyond me. And how do you see the state of Virginia developing the uh, credit market expertise, you know, to do credit analysis on individual students to make sure 